Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, the 1937 Auto Union Type C, brought to us in 118th scale by CMC. The story of the Auto Union Type C, it is one that is rather circuitous, prestigious, yes, but also it has a direct tie to one of the most infamous events ever to occur in the whole of known human history. Yes, of course, I am talking about World War II, and I am talking about Germany in World War II. For better or worse, that is the origin of this car. It is the origin of the Auto Union Company, and while Auto Union is no longer with us, at least in this name, Auto Union did become the Audi Porsche Volkswagen Group that we still very much know today, and of course they are one of the world's largest and most successful automakers as a total conglomerate. Germany, post-World War I, was in absolutely dire socioeconomic straits. The Treaty of Versailles had been signed. Germany had been fronted with almost the entire amount of the blame for World War I, and therefore they had been ordered to pay reparations to the rest of Europe, therefore. This left Germany in tatters. Economically, they were ruined. Socially, they were ruined. And, as history has shown us, this left the door wide open for somebody who was charismatic, and somebody who sounded like they had good ideas and good intentions, although, of course, we know the truth behind all of that, that somebody was Adolf Hitler. And his message of, we're Germans, we're better than this, and we can do great things, sounded good to the German populace. And he was elected chancellor in 1933, along with his National Socialist Workers' Party. We know the rest of the story, and that is not a good story, although one that absolutely deserves to be remembered. However, some of the other byproducts of the lead-up to World War II and the atrocities that were committed against Germany and the German people, they weren't all bad. In engineering terms, there was a lot of technological advancement during that time. And part of Hitler's idea of making Germany retain and reclaim the prestige which it had known prior to the beginning of the 20th century, involved creating an image for Germany. And that image was one that needed to be one of strength, of innovation, and of technical prowess. One of the ways that Hitler chose to do that was through motor racing. German engineering has a long and well-deserved reputation as being very good, sometimes very ornate, but all in all, some of the best in the world. And that goes back to these days, prior to World War II, with that auto union group. This car designed by none other than Dr. Ferdinand Porsche, it was designed for the European Grand Prix Championship of 1936 and 1937, and quite a lot that we see on this car was absolutely revolutionary for the time. And if we want to look at it in the context of the modern day, you can see, well, we've got a front axle, a rear axle, a cockpit behind the rear axle, a fuel tank behind the cockpit, and then an engine and drive line behind the fuel tank. It's a mid-engine car with open wheels. Does it remind you of anything? It reminds me an awful lot of, I don't know, the Formula One World Championship. Here it is, 1936 technology. We have an open-wheeled race car that has exactly the same macrocosmic technical layout as a modern Grand Prix car. 80 years ago. That's what we're talking about here today. And of course, we're also talking about this CMC model, which has over 1,000 individual parts, handcrafted, noble materials throughout. It's a sight to behold. So although this car does harken back to an era that was punctuated by unspeakable atrocity, and the person who financed it, or at least ordered it to be financed on behalf of the German people, for better or worse. Unfortunately, that story is one that is very unpleasant, but very important, and I felt that it's important to acknowledge the car's true origin. But, be that as it may, the car itself still stands as a testament to what human minds can achieve when they're faced with a task, when they're faced with relatively limited technology, given the era from which this car hails, and they're still able to do groundbreaking things that ultimately set the stage for every open-wheel race car that has followed it. Let's take a closer look at this 118th scale rendition of the Auto Union Type C by CMC. With our car parked over there for the moment, before we take a closer look at the model, let's take a look at the box from whence it comes. Here it is, and the only reason why we're looking at the box is because it's, uh, well, 
It's a rather ornate one. This being a CMC model, they do take great pride in their products and not only in the products themselves, but they want to deliver them in a way that is befitting the subject matter of the model and really just indicative of the overall craftsmanship thereof. So this is the box, CMC Auto Union Type C, 1936-1937, scale 118, and there you go. In the upper left there is your CMC logo. Item number is M034. So there you go for those of you keeping score. But uh, there it is. It's a rather ornate box, and what you're seeing right now is the outer dust sleeve, really. Obviously, we've got ourselves our disclaimers and legalese warnings in uh, assorted languages. Looks like we've got German, English, Italian, Spanish, and French here with your CMC contact information, all of that. CMC-modelcars.de Yes, yeah, so we've got ourselves a German model of a German car, so we've got some authenticity there. We've got ourselves this rather extensive write-up about the car as well, giving us uh, some pretty good history on it, because this is a very old car, obviously, and uh, believe it or not, even though the Germans are a little bit notorious for fastidious record-keeping, it's a little difficult to get good, reliable information about it simply because immediately in the aftermath of this car coming on the scene and winning the Grand Prix World Championship as it was at the time, we had World War II breakouts, so a lot of the information was lost or misplaced or who knows what happened to it. But enough is known, obviously, to make some good models of this car, and I do believe that there are a couple of running replica examples that are uh, maintained by Audi, the company that auto union really turned into at least one of them today so this description reads cmc auto union type c 1936 1937 developed by ferdinand porsche yes that ferdinand porsche this race car made history in a way that virtually no other race car had done before with the type c in 1936 auto union introduced a monoposto that's a single seater in italian that was almost totally different from all other race cars up to that time the most striking feature was the unconventional design of the sensational 16-cylinder V-type engine installed behind the driver and ahead of the rear axle, an innovation which soon became an accepted practice. Perhaps the greatest reason for the success of the 520-horsepower Bullet was its highly talented race driver, Bernd Rosemeyer. In 1936, which was his most successful year, he became the European champion and won numerous Grand Prix races. In 1937, this new ace of Auto Union kept his main competitor, Mercedes-Benz, in check and was able to continue his successful career with five more wins. At the beginning of 1938, however, his career came to an abrupt and tragic end due to a fatal accident that occurred while he was trying to break the world speed record. After the end of the Second World War, the remaining race cars in Zikvau were turned over to the Soviet Union as reparation payment. It is still unknown what exactly happened to the race cars. The Auto Union Type C is hand-assembled from 1,026 parts into an extraordinary precision model. The individual parts are made of high-quality materials, 23 parts are zinc die-cast, 754 are metal or copper, and 153 are made of plastic. The remaining 96 parts are screws, rivets, or simulated screw heads. For the first time, CMC is presenting a model in 118th scale that is composed of more than 1,000 parts, a milestone in its history. So we have a little bit of a write-up about the car itself. One of the people, anyway, who drove it, designed by Ferdinand Porsche, Dr. Porsche. Of course, you could really thank him for being one of the principal innovators of the modern motor car. Dr. Porsche's designs really were some things that are still used today in basically every car, whether it be a street car or a race car. And this car, of course, being really the first, in my opinion, mid-engine, open-wheel race car, that design language really translates into every open-wheel racing series that we see. How many front-engine open-wheel race cars are built today? Zero. So there you go. This is your genesis moment for Formula One, for IndyCar, for your other junior open-wheel series anywhere in the world. Even the humble little Formula 2000 car shares its lineage and can trace directly back to this car right here from 1936 with this design by Dr. Porsche. For the CMC model, we have over a thousand parts here in 118 scale, 1026 to be exact, so we have got ourselves quite the design in terms of the car itself, in terms of the prototype, as well as what we have here in this 118 scale model. If we remove the dust jacket from the box, what do we have here? Well, we have got the box proper, CMC exclusive models, at least that's what it says in German there. 
The box is covered in this uh, stitched leatherette, so that's pretty nice. Or actually, maybe real leather, I'm not entirely sure, but there it is. You can see what it is, and uh, it obviously protects the model quite nicely. It further protects the model. I'm not showing you this part, but when you open the box, there is a foam sarcophagus here, and there's an upper panel of this, which I've since removed, because in here, the model is, and we have got ourselves our foam overwrap to protect the paint from the styrofoam that would be sitting over top of this. Remove that, you can see that we have got our cradle for the model to sit in. We've got our desiccant pouches there. We've got the tag from CMC, so there you go. There's the uh, serial number, 14738. And then the last bit that we have here, we have got a pair of tweezers, forceps, whatever you want to call them. This is absolutely critical for interfacing with this thing, so we'll be using that as well as a little dust cloth there. So uh, that's the box. And as you can see, pretty comprehensive in terms of what it does give you, and uh, obviously protects the model really well. You've got this little silk ribbon here to keep the uh, lid on, keep it from falling off. And then of course you've got yourself your packaging material there to keep the uh, model safe from the rest of the foam in the packaging. So there's the box, and uh, yeah, the box alone is something to appreciate, but of course the model is an entirely different story altogether. You want detail? This has got it. With the car rotating once again, some more detailed technical specifications here on the Auto Union Type C. It is, of course, a class Grand Prix race car. By Grand Prix, we mean the pre-World War II Grand Prix days, the real Grand Prix days as far as the anoraks of motorsport history are concerned. Those days being prior to World War II. Of course, the Grand Prix Championship, at least the European Grand Prix Championship as it was then, became what we know today as the FIA Formula One World Championship, but that didn't start officially until 1950. So prior to 1950, there were Grand Prix championships, nationwide championships, regional championships in the form of the European Championship, where this car contested, of course, all pre-war days, but all of that was standardized and homologated into Formula One starting in 1950. So this is really, if you want to be technical about it, it's, it's a Formula One car before Formula One, if that makes any sense. And a lot of the engineering that went into this car is something that you will see on every Formula One car made since about 1960 all the way to the present day. But we're talking 30 years before 1960. That's how sophisticated and advanced the engineering on this car was. And when we get into some of the technical details, you'll see just how groundbreaking and visionary a design this was. It is, of course, the Auto Union Type C designed between 1936 and 1937 when they were also produced and when they were also racing, and it is a Grand Prix class car. Wheelbase on this thing, 114 and a half inches, so we're talking about a similar wheelbase to, believe it or not, a modern Formula One car. In fact, this one is a little bit shorter than some of the Formula One cars racing in 2020. Looking at you, Mercedes, basically a Greyhound bus going out there, but I digress. What does this thing not have in common, though, with the modern Grand Prix car? Well, the engine, first of all, yes, it's mounted in the back, behind the fuel tank, and behind the cockpit, as you'll see in basically every open-wheeled car today, but that engine is a V16, displacing 5 liters, or actually displacing 6 liters later on in this specification, the 1937 specification, they enlarged it to 6 1,006 cubic centimeters, so just over 6 liters. It's a V16 supercharged at 45 degrees. So 16 cylinders, four-stroke engine, of course, with overhead camshafts, but 16 cylinders. That is something that not even the glorious V12 Formula One cars could aspire to achieve. About 520, 530 horsepower out of that engine, and an absolute monstrosity of torque. We'll get into the torque later on about this thing, but 16 cylinder at 45 degrees in a V. The bore on that engine is 75 millimeters and it's an 85 millimeter stroke. So yeah, you can see where they get the displacement from. As we mentioned, 520 horsepower officially here, probably generating a little bit more than that, depending on where they were racing, the atmospheric conditions, the height above sea level and all of that, but supercharged. So forced induction all the way back in 1937. 
5,000 RPM is where it was making that 520-ish horsepower power figure, but the torque was really where this thing had its hallmark. Really low down in the rev range the torque came in, and I mean 5,000 RPM is the effective red line on it, so low down in the rev range means 1,000 RPM or so. Basically just off idle is where this thing was making maximum torque. Gearbox in this thing, we've got a four-speed gearbox officially. There are some sources that say that this had a five-speed gearbox, so I'm going to say it's a four-speed. Lots and lots and lots of driver skill it required to operate this thing. Obviously, it's a four-speed gearbox. Synchro mesh was barely a thing in road cars at this time. It certainly wasn't a thing in race cars, and still synchro mesh, not really a thing in race cars. So, basically, it's a crash box. Lots of driver skill required. With all of that torque from the engine, if you missed a gear, I'd imagine the entire drivetrain would be absolutely toasted in about one second, if not less. But, yeah. Overall track on this thing, 54 inches wide, front and rear, so absolutely identical front and rear specifications on the track across that 114 and a half inch wheel base. The tires on the front, we have 5.25 by 17 inch tires in the front, and you can see just how narrow they are. It doesn't get all that much better on the rear. They are 7 by 19 inches in the rear, so 17 inches in diameter in the front, 19 inches in diameter in the rear, and slightly wider to deal with the ungodly amount of torque in that engine. Specific torque figures can't really come across them, but Given the stroke length and given the displacement on that 16-cylinder engine, knowing that it's also supercharged, I would say easily 500 foot-pounds of torque, probably more. Absolutely ridiculous. And of course those tires with inner tubes in them, they are basically the same as a modern bicycle tire. The amount of grip that they didn't give was absolutely horrifying. In terms of driving this thing, it didn't matter if it was wet or dry. It had no traction regardless. But the saving grace of it was, even though this thing was very sophisticated in its day, it has a ladder frame chassis made out of lightweight metals such as magnesium and things like that, but the torsional rigidity in the basically racing cars of antiquity, as this were in relative terms, basically non-existent. So if you're talking about getting the power down, the tires are no help, but the chassis flex actually is a help. With all of that engine power and all of that low down torque, it would basically twist the chassis around so that your inboard leaf spring suspension at the back would actually have a lot of room to deflect and sort of shimmy around and try to get the power down as best as it could through those teeny tiny tires. But really what it did was it imparted a huge yaw moment into the car, which meant that the steering angle basically comes secondary to the throttle angle. So the drivers who piloted this thing in anger, they were steering just as much with the gas as they were steering with the actual steering system. So there you go in terms of what's going on. Your suspension arrangement, as we alluded to, we have inboard leaf springs in the rear, so we don't have any McPherson-style struts and shock absorbers here. It's all leaf springs at the rear, and in the front, we don't have torsion bars. I mean, yeah, we do technically have a torsion bar, but we really have a friction pack front suspension. You'll notice, and we'll take a closer look at this later, you will notice that we have these two discs mounted inboard on the front axle. And what those actually are, are the dampers. You can see coming across here on the front end, those two circular structures, they are actually discs, not very much unlike from a modern clutch pack. But what they are is they are a series of concentric rings that are backed up and packed together with leather discs. And in terms of setting the spring rate and roll rate on the front end, they would actually swap out leather discs of varying thickness to increase or decrease the friction being imparted into those dampers via the torsion bar. So they would rotate and they would resist static friction. And in so doing, they would control the spring rate on the front end. And of course, they'd uh, imagine they'd control the ride height on the front end as well via that arrangement. Very, very crude, not at all dissimilar from horse-drawn carriages, to be honest, you know, springing them on leather, basically. But that's what they did for the front end on this thing. You will not see coilover springs anywhere in the suspension arrangement on this car. Absolutely wild to consider these days, but that's what they did. And, of course, a lot of that was in the name of saving weight. Weight, of course, was very important these days. I don't know how much this car actually weighed, but I would assume in excess of two standard tons. I mean, yes, they had a lot of 
new age components for that time. Lots of aerospace grade aluminum and magnesium used in the construction of this car. But all in all, we're still talking about 80 year old technology. So things have just moved on so much. Springing it on leather, my God. I could not even begin to imagine. But that's what they did, and it worked. Wild. Now, taking a closer look at some of the details on this model, and by some of the details, I mean, where do you want to begin? There are 1,026 individual parts making up this model, according to CMC on their box. And it really, really shows. I mean, just looking here at the front end alone, that grill, that's all hand done, soldered at the joints there, with a photo etch mesh in front, actual metal. The rivet heads that you can see, the screw heads that we can see. On the brake duct there, yeah, believe it or not, this right here, that's actually a brake duct, ladies and gentlemen. Looks somewhat familiar, almost looks like modern Formula One brake duct, except this one is done in probably stamped aluminum rather than carbon fiber, but wow. And there are even screw heads on the brake duct itself. There's one of the uh, front suspension dampers, for want of a better term, basically a series of leather discs. Ridiculous. Moving up, you can see the top side bodywork with our, yeah, radiator cap right there with a coolant overflow overpressure. Yup, there it was. Windscreen, cockpit windscreen, which, which folds down so that you can get the model in the box without damaging it, but there it is. We have got wing mirrors here. Not that we have wings on the car, but wing mirrors nonetheless. The wheels, have a look at the wheels on this thing. Those are hand done, hand woven, wire spoke wheels, and you can see just how intricate they are with our knockoff wheel hub and wheel nut there. Crazy, absolutely crazy. The wheels are removable as well. Here's the valve stem for filling up the tire, moving the rears toward the cockpit area. There you go, more rivet heads and screw heads. These little loops here, which I'm not entirely sure what they were for. Maybe, maybe they had a rudimentary seat belt that could be fitted into the car. Or perhaps that was just for securing ancillary components in the cockpit. Maybe a water bottle for the driver or, a, you know, a, a gin bottle or something for the driver in these days. You got the seat, normal seat, no seat belts in this model. I don't know if they ever ran with seat belts. I would think probably not, because the thinking in these days and even all the way up to the 60s in Formula One was if you crashed, you wanted to be thrown out of the car because you're basically driving a bomb. It's, it's crazy. Latches that actually do secure the bodywork. We'll take these off in a little while. You can see more of that detail. And then your exhaust primaries here, eight exhausts per side, of course, on a 16 cylinder engine. Moving back, here is your transverse leaf spring for the rear suspension. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And of course, the rear wheel and tire with another hand woven spoke arrangement there. There's just so much to see on this thing, and that's just one angle of it. It's wild, absolutely wild. Just taking a look now from front on, there is that grill that we mentioned. Photo etched parts here in front. All this is in metal. That's really cool. And you can see how the light is sort of banding through that. Very, very cool. Awesome. The radiator matrix behind. All of those uh, bolt heads and uh, rivet heads that we talked about, they're all there. And then our front suspension arrangement, as we can see it now. Basically, we have got upper and lower control arms with our track rod, tie rod back here for our steering with that knuckle, and of course that's articulated as you can see, so the steering actually does work. Very cool. We have brake lines here, drum brakes of course on this car, so all of this inside here, this is the brake pack, so you've got the brake drum, which rotates with the wheel hub, and then you have brake shoes, basically big brake pads, inside there that expand outward to clamp uh, outwardly from the inside onto the drum. So the interface of the, uh, the inner surface of the drum interfaces with the pads inside. They expand outward on a spring arrangement or hydraulic arrangement, really hydraulic spring arrangement here, and they slow the car down. Drum brakes can be very powerful, and they're still used today on a lot of road cars, and I think even some race cars and some junior series still use drum brakes, but the big drawback of them is they get very, very hot, and they can't be cooled easily. You can see we've got a big brake duct here, of course, on both front end uh, wheels here, but 
they're nowhere near as efficient at heat dissipation as disc brakes uh, later became because they are exposed directly to the ambient air and you can ram air through them. You can put air through the disc in terms of the veins cast into a brake disc. So as they rotate, they sort of turn into a centrifugal pump that's uh, just shuttling air in and out of them constantly. So a lot of heat dissipation advantages in a disc brake, which is why most cars today use disc brakes. But here, drums were the way to make an automotive brake. So we've got drums, they have big ducts in them, they've got other um, veins here, basically a rudimentary heat sink in here, trying to dissipate that heat as best they could, but the brakes were woeful on this thing anyway, especially in a modern context. So really, they're using the transmission to go down the box to slow the car down via engine braking. Of course, this thing made a ton of compression, particularly because it is forced induction, so I'd imagine engine braking on this car probably more effective than the actual wheel brakes in a lot of situations. So that's where the drivers were really earning their money in terms of how much nerve could they have to keep their foot in the throttle and then come off of the throttle, use the engine brake, and get down to the box efficiently and precisely enough because, again, no synchro mesh. Those down changes had better be rev matched right, otherwise kablamo. But given the technology of the time, very impressive, but given the technology that we have today, nope, no chance you wouldn't catch me dead driving this thing. Unbelievable. Taking a look now from the right side, what do we have? Well, we've got ourselves our front end. There is our wire spoke wheel again. But now we can start to take a look some more at how this car actually works. There's our cockpit, of course. It's, it's terrifyingly open. You are so exposed in this cockpit, but safety wasn't even remotely a consideration in these days. The driver is in this car simply because somebody needs to operate it. There's no consideration at all made for driver comfort or driver safety. You can see the fuel filler is right on top, right behind the driver's head, which in all likelihood came above the top structure of the car. And that's not a roll structure. That's just there basically to control the airflow coming away from the driver's head. But <laughs> no safety at all in this. But you can see that we have an external cooling line here. This is carrying water, or whatever other coolant they were using, probably water. You can see that it's secured by these metal straps. They are actually metal, and they're secured with teeny tiny rivets. And this is carrying that hot water coming from the jackets around the cylinders and the engine, and that's being pumped via the, I'd assume, a gear-driven water pump forward into the radiator which is inside here. So all of this would be mighty hot as the drivers run around. This is right next to the driver's right arm. So I would imagine cockpit temperatures were pretty high and if you happen to get thrown around in the cockpit as I'm sure they did, you would be getting burned big time just driving this car. And of course the gear lever in this thing is down to the driver's right much like it is in most race cars today. So. Every time he's reaching for a gear change, he's probably brushing up against that absolutely boiling hot pipe. So, uh, heavy wool suits, probably leather gloves, you know, whatever they could get to try and insulate themselves from that absolutely scalding hot pipe probably is going to be their friend in there. But again, driver comfort and driver safety, <laughs> that doesn't mean anything in these days. Moving your rears, you can see the louvers across the engine cover here in the rear bodywork, yes, it is an engine cover, believe it or not. Some things are still the same. Sort of a rudimentary shark fin here. No, of course it's not. That's to cover the uh, intake plenum on the engine, which actually intakes from the rear, believe it or not. You can see um, toward the rear later on, it's behind the rear tire right now, but there are two intake snorkels behind there, and that's where the supercharger is picking up all of the intake charge. But these panels here, of course, they would all be hand done. You can see that they're all riveted in position. Little strap down here, just securing that rocker panel. And then moving the rears toward that rear axle with that wheel detail again. That's something else. It really, really is. Have a look at all of that. That just looks absolutely resplendent. You can see the detail in there. Glorious stuff. Of course, there are brakes at the rear as well, more drums. So again, you're not going to see into a brake disc because there is no brake disc. Absolutely nuts. You can see the paint finish on there with that light speckling throughout. That's good. 
yeah, it's, uh, it's a very much a sign of just how far technology has come. But just take a look at this profile. I mean, we've got you know, a front axle here. We've got a driver largely behind the front axle. We have a fuel tank and we have an engine and drive line. So macrocosmically, the plan of this car, it's still what's being used. And this is 1936 technology. Wild. From the rear now, here's where we start to get into more technicalities. Here, first of all, are the half shafts coming out of the differential. Actually, it was a ZF differential, so there's a familiar name. They were around in the 30s, obviously, but there you go. So there's your drive line, rear wheel drive, of course. So you'd have your gearbox coming off of the engine and then going through your differential and then out to your driven axle. Behind there, you can see this oblong structure, and this protrudes quite a bit from the rear of the car. This is where you would engage a starter motor, so an electric motor out the back to spin up the engine through the gearbox to start the engine. So just like a modern Formula One car, no onboard starter. That's to save weight and general complexity. You don't have to lug the uh, starter motor around nor the driveline for the starter motor. So there you go. Some more commonalities between this and the modern Grand Prix machinery, although very modern Formula One cars in the hybrid era, they are self-starting, or at least they can be self-starting, but you don't see them do it all that often. Some more linkages toward your rear suspension. This is probably a torsion bar down uh, between this fairing here inboard. Again, you can see that we have got linkages here. I guess you could almost call it a multi-link. So you've got leaf springs that are running forward, and then you've got this, probably again, torsion bar across the rear, um, a little bit aft. So that's interesting. Back here as well, you can see these twin snorkels. These are the air intakes for the engine. So the supercharger intake is right behind here, and then you have some ancillary cooling back here with these louvers. But intake charge is all the way at the back, and then the supercharger gets a hold of it and compresses it and funnels it forward into the intake plenum, which is forward toward the top of the engine. So interesting induction arrangement on this car. But again, it was all done for economy of space. Just like today, these guys were also concerned with packaging. The more efficiently packaged everything is on your race car, you've got yourself more room to do different things. Aerodynamics, not really a consideration in terms of generating grip via downforce, but in terms of straight line speed, remember, pre-war Grand Prix are being held on public roads a lot of long straights there were some permanent circuits in this era you had Donington Park you had Brooklyn's you had the Nürburgring so some familiar circuits which still exist even were uh, used in the uh, European Grand Prix championships way back when but Lots of long straights, so you're trying to make the car slippery to go as fast as possible in a straight line. Believe it or not, these things could do over 200 miles per hour, so just consider that for a moment. But slippery as a fish, as you can see, and again, a lot of design cues taken from aviation, which Germany was also pretty good at in this era. From the left side of the car, not as much to look at on this side. We don't have that big cooling pipe, but again, you can see a lot of that same workmanship in terms of the body panels and things, nicely done here. There's your left front wheel, again, with the wire spokes in there, very cool. You can see toward the bottom of the wheel, we've got our valve stem for uh, tire pressure. And then moving the rears, you can see, again, more of that riveting around here, separating the uh, bulkhead there from the cockpit, and moving the rears Toward our engine cover again. Fuel tank inset between those two shut lines. Big fuel tank, really. And of course, this would be a very thirsty engine. Not running gasoline as we know it, though. Probably running mixtures of straight benzene and tuline and more volatile alcohols, and things like that, making all that power. But that's what they were doing. Very corrosive, highly flammable fuels. And um, for pit stops, they would be refueling while the driver had a cigarette. So just consider that for a moment. Just ridiculous. Across the top, those louvers cooling that engine as best they can. There are your primaries for the left bank. And then across the back with our left rear wheel and tire. There we go. There's your starter shaft back there. Ridiculous stuff. Absolutely ridiculous stuff. And again, you see just the intricacies of that detail here that CMC have done with the uh, latches back here. 
Almost there we go. So these latches actually work. So they are engaged right now. They're secured with these little rubber O-rings. They really are, but they're these little rubber latches that secure the rear engine cover. It's nuts. All kinds of crazy, crazy details are available if you're looking for them on this thing. Let's take a closer look at some of these details now. So first of all, here on the front end, getting a bit closer in than we could prior, there are your front suspension assemblies there with your friction packs. Ridiculous to set the spring rate and overall um, spring deflection on this thing. Up top, there is the Auto Union logo. Of course, that looks very familiar. Audi using basically this logo still to this day. Across the top side bodywork, there you go. Front uh, intake probably for uh, cooling the engine, I would say, because your radiator is up here. Down here, you have got more latches securing the front end bodywork, which also comes off. Then we get into the cockpit. Have a look at the cockpit on this. Yeah, <laughs> not much to see here in terms of, you know, modern day trickery because, well, there is no modern day in this era. But look what you do have. These big, round, bold-faced gauges, very much like you still would see today in aircraft. Tachometer there tilted over so that red line is over there toward the driver's right where he's going to be looking for it as he's changing gear. Big steering wheel, which actually does have a quick release. Those, uh, those I guess you could say that they're paddles behind the steering wheel. That connects to a collar that will detach the wheel from the steering column, make it easier for the driver to get in and out. Behind there, you can see more dash detail against the bulkhead. And then below, there are more tubes that are going to be carrying coolant in all likelihood. You can see the floor pan, then coming down. We do have a chassis plate in there. And way down in there, I don't think we're going to get the light in there too well, but there are pedals there. Three pedals in the uh, proper normal arrangement as far as I know. And then, yeah, you just get in and drive it. No radio switch, no Bono, my tires are dead switch, nothing. Just drive the thing, and if you survive, maybe you win. Ridiculous. Across to the side, there's your gear lever with your gate. And then you can see those lines done in, I guess there's some sort of braided fabric. They're just carrying, uh, again, probably more coolant through there. Very, very cool. And there is that coolant pipe from the right side. You can see that does come into the cockpit. So again, the gear lever is there. The coolant pipe is there. I don't think there was much insulation around it. So again, every time the driver went for a gear, he had to be real careful not to hit that pipe. Otherwise, big time burns. There's your seat. That's done in fabric. We have a sort of leatherette headrest. Then across the seat, you've got this fabric material. Looks good. Fits well. And of course, no seat belts or anything like that to be found. Crazy. Top side bodywork, there's your fuel filler, which does open. And then your engine cover with your exhaust primaries on either side, latches, and then the intakes with the wire mesh across them, inboard side of the rear brakes with your brake lines you can see, that little copper line also visible, across the front brake you can see the same, so cool, so very very cool. Upper and lower control arm as you can see there, and then you have your tie rod for the steering. Nuts. Absolutely nutty, nutty, nutty stuff. And again, the fact that they went into this sort of detail for a 1 18th scale model, that's a sight to behold in and of itself. Now to take the bodywork off the car, it is very much a two-handed operation and it's a little bit of an intricate operation because all of these little latches that you see through here, they're actual latches, and they actually do secure the bodywork. If I try to lift up on this, it's not moving. So we gotta take these latches off. So to do that, we very carefully use our supplied angled tweezers here, and then we grab and undo those latches. And it's a little bit finicky, as you can see, but you grab in the uh, hooked section of the latch, and then you pull up very gently because you'll bend these real easy and then uh, good luck ever getting this back together. But uh, you gotta grab them, pull them up, and they come undone, as you can see. And of course we have four on the front, so we've got two per side. And on the right side, same thing. You probably won't be able to see too well here, but we will 
pull up. We can get our tweezers in there. Tough doing this on an angle having to maneuver around a camera. But eventually, and also I have a brake line in my way. All right, so there's number three. And wait for it, wait for it. Come on. Gotta be real careful not to grab the brake line while you're doing this because you will rip that off and that's never getting back on. And wait, I think I've done it. We're nearly, nearly done it. Yep, number four is off. So from this point, you can uh, go ahead and lift the front bodywork off. So now with all the latches removed, the front bodywork just lifts off like so, and we set it aside. Now, taking a look at what's going on here, so much stuff to look at. I mean, where do you begin? Have a look at all of this. There's your radiator, again with a photo etched matrix in there. There's your coolant reservoir, your pipes there done in copper with a little spring over it so that it can expand and contract with temperature. That's feeding your thermostat in the cockpit. More braided lines there, probably for the overflow. Absolutely wild stuff. You got this. I don't know if this is, uh, no, that's probably a water tank, I would think, for cooling the engine a bit more. You have hose clamps with rubber around them. It's nuts. It's absolutely wild. The amount of detail that you get in this thing. Clearly, that's a water interface from the water pump. Nuts. Absolutely wild, the amount of detail that CMC put into this thing. 1,026 individual parts. I, I believe it. I really, really do believe it. Let's have a look. Wild. Absolutely wild. Nuts. And of course, that doesn't say anything about the rear. There's a whole lot more to see back here. So the rear bodywork also secured with these latches, which uh, quite obviously we got to undo in the similar manner to how we did the front. Pull up, and they come down. And the rear one, these are easier to do because they're higher up and there's not as much in your way. But, grab that up top, pull up, and that comes undone. And of course, the same on the other side. Two more. Do the rear one. There we go. And the front. There we go. Easy as you like. And then that allows you, quite simply, to pull up on the rear bodywork, which then comes off, and we can set that aside elsewhere. We'll take a look at this V16. So the bodywork is removed. Here is the right side of the front end. Yep. All that same detail still there. Crazy stuff. So there's that big coolant pipe again. You can see how that feeds the coolant reservoir, which then goes to the radiator. And then your cockpit again. Now here is the V16. Have a look. Yep. Six liters displacement, 16 cylinders, 500 plus horsepower. There's your supercharger here. You can see it's a twin scroll supercharger. Your Probably brake manifold back there. Gearbox is mounted below and behind all of this. And then the engine. Top of the engine, there's your intake plenum. And this structure, this cylindrical structure in silver on top, that's probably a blow-off valve. That is a wastegate, so to speak, so that you don't overpressure the intake plenum. But you can see how all of that is put together. There is a braided line coming from the fuel tank. So obviously that is uh, going toward fuel pump here, probably driven off of the camshaft from the right bank. So there you go. And the supercharger, of course, and your intakes run from this direction. That's real cool to see. Some dust, blow that away, nice. And just take a look at the overall disposition of this. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. Reasonably compact engine given the uh, displacement six liters and given the fact that it has 16 cylinders But there you go. There's the rear bulkhead encompassing the rear panel of the fuel tank Back through there All of that looks well and good And all of these noble materials here. We've got braided um, fabric. We have got copper. We've got zinc 
all kinds of things going on. So really, it uh, looks very, very much like the prototype, I would assume. Exhaust primary is just exa exhausting straight up to atmosphere. Then our fuel filler, as you can see. This also opens. Get our camera lined up and get our tweezers lined up. And it will open up much like you see. Might be easier just to do it by hand. Let me see. There we go. Fuel filler is open. Look down inside. And there is actually a mesh screen in there. There we go. That's coming through nicely now. Mesh screen. So there's your fuel filter. <laughs> any sort of, uh, I don't know, any sort of live wild animals that are going to fall into there are going to be stopped by that screen. But obviously very, very rudimentary. But uh, obviously they would be running bespoke fuels in here. So that's what you've got absolutely nuts the amount of detail on this thing but yeah there's the car opened up crazy absolutely crazy details also the wheels come off so these knockoff hubs they do secure the wheels and you do this by hand you just unscrew them and they come off they don't give you a special tool like you get on some exoto or true scale miniatures models these just unscrew as you would expect them to do. Rather long uh, stub axles here. So eventually they come undone and then you just pull the wheel off and you can see now the car is going to fall over to that side because you pull the wheel off. But you can see the brake disc in there as you would expect or the brake drum I should say. It doesn't rotate but you can see it there on the stub axle and there is even this very tiny spacer that you can see coming into the shot maybe. Where is it? There it is. That little spacer. So that will go behind the nut over the top of the stub axle just to allow the wheel to rotate. So keep track of that as well. So with the car completely undone, it looks like this, as you can see. So everything is now exposed. Um, not much to see really with the wheels off, other than the overall proportions of the car with the wheels off. But uh, really, because of the nature of the drum brakes, not really a whole lot more detail can be discerned here. But uh, again, just wanted to show you that, of course, that is possible to remove all the wheels. And uh, quite obviously, yeah, you take the wheels off and it looks like that. And just a look across the bottom, show you what it looks like here. The car will not stay up, so I have to hold it in position. But you can see there's the bottom slide of the engine, the crankcase. Dry sump oil system, is it? It might be. I'm not sure. But there you go. You can see everything is closed up down here as much as it can be for aerodynamic purposes, quite obviously. There it is, Auto Union 118, Type C, 1936-1937, CMC GmbH Germany. That's what that says there. Very cool, very, very cool. You can also see uh, the uh, particulate matter that you can see, I believe that's graphite that's uh, put in there as a lubricant when they're making the models themselves. It came out of the axles. It didn't come from the threads, it came from the axles themselves. So not worried about that, but there you go. Very, very cool stuff to see. Really, really amazing. Just getting everything reassembled here. You can see that the reassembly is very, very finicky because you've got to get these little latches back over the uh, hooks. And that is much easier said than done at this scale. I mean, I appreciate the detail, don't get me wrong, but it makes it a little bit laborious to really take it apart and show it off. And uh, you can see I had one practice run this morning. <laughs> and, uh, putting this back together is a little tricky. I'm trying to get one latch in. And so far, I'm not having success with this. Metal on metal with these tweezers, so there's not much grip to be had. And I'm dealing with that suspension pack. So it's not so easy as you may suspect. But if at first you don't succeed, try until you go crazy. I missed it. Let's 
you got to be able to grab the thing properly. There we go. No. Ah, so close. You see, you can just barely get it on there, and then it falls off. Is that attached? Yes, success. Second one is a little easier because you're not as close to the front suspension. There you go. Quick as you like, that one went on. How about that? And the same story on the right side. Let's see, is this angle even going to work for me? I'm going to find out. Got the forward latch. Depth perception, folks. Let's see. I did not just put that on in one go. <laughs> I put that on in one go, how about that? And then this one, almost. There you go. Well, uh, the front end there on the right side was a little bit easier. Beginner's luck? Yeah, probably. And the engine cover is much the same story. Make sure that you don't put the engine cover um, in front of any of the latches like this. You don't want this. You gotta reach in and make sure that they are down and out of the way on all sides before it goes down. All right, so that's in place. So quite obviously we grab these. And they go over top, there you go. Easy as you like. You probably can't see this one on the rear, but that's going on right now because I'm now on a roll with this. There we go, that's on, easy. And on the left side, much the same. Rear one first, grab it. Get it on, almost. Eh, almost. Nope, not quite. Still not quite. Still not quite. Really wishing I didn't have uh, a third cup of coffee. I can, uh, I can hear 8802 Gator and his shaky hands McGee comments already. There we go, that got in. And now, wait for it. There we go. All right, all the body work is now secured once more and uh, get the car basically ready. Get the uh, windscreen back up. And there you go. Very, very, very much. Fuel cap closed. So there it is. Ready to go back in the box. So there it was in 1 18th scale by CMC, the 1936-1937 Auto Union Type C. This car is born out of one of the worst events ever to occur throughout human history. There's no getting away from that. And I hope that acknowledging it is not going to be something that is offensive to people because history is history, and if we forget history, well, the old adage says we're doomed to repeat it. However, acknowledging the atrocities that were committed in this era by the country of origin from which this car hails, I hope that we're able as well to put into perspective that there is always another side to the story. Yes, Horrible things happened in Germany during this era. But good things also happened. Things that ultimately benefited the rest of the world. And some of those good things were in engineering. Every car that's on the road today has some sort of connection, for better or worse, to the innovations that came out of Germany in that era between the wars. Every car on the road today can thank Dr. Porsche for innovations such as the Synchromesh gearbox. Every car on the road today can benefit from ideas such as independent suspension, and torsion bars, and even the mid-engine layout. Of course, not so much really suitable to most road cars, but motor racing. If you're making an open-wheeled car, the mid-engine layout is the way to do that. So for better or worse, this car, born out of such tumult and such terror, honestly 
it was a trailblazer nonetheless. And I hope that portraying it in this way is really something that is a, a valuable exercise because it's not to be seen as an endorsement by any means of the philosophy that created it, but it is meant to be a bit of an appreciation from a strictly engineering sense and a strictly historical sense of what it was and how it came to be and ultimately what its influence was. As far as CMC's take on this car and their modeling of it, absolutely exquisite. What can you say? 1,026 individual parts, many of which are out of noble materials. You've got rivets, you've got screws, you've got simulated rivet heads and screw heads, you have latches that actually secure the bodywork, you have rubber hoses, you have actual metal hose clamps in many places, you've got knockoff hubs that secure the wheels, anything that you can imagine, a little almost hair-like copper brake lines in here. It's all there, and it's all done correctly and properly, and it looks absolutely immaculate. 16-cylinder engine, supercharged, um, overhead cam, there it is. Whatever you want to see on this model in terms of a detail, it's there. And I've got to say, it is one of the best I have ever seen full stop of any car. Not just racing cars, not just historic cars. It's unbelievably well done. If every 118th scale model that we've ever taken a look at on this channel could look like this and could be produced like this, the world would be a far richer place and... There it is, CMC. As far as the model is concerned, just looking at that for a moment, unbelievable model. If you want one, get one. They're still available. I think they've been out of production for a few years, but they made quite a few of them. So they are still available, even from first-hand retailers. So if you do want one, you can get one. The larger subject, though, of the actual car, what it was and where it came from, perhaps that's something that is left in terms of discourse to people who are more informed than I, and to some people who perhaps can explore these topics in a more eloquent and a more sensitive manner than I'm capable, other than for me to say, no, absolutely, I do not condone or endorse or in any way approve of the actions, politically and militarily, that were undertaken by the Third Reich at any point. I do not at all agree with their philosophy, anything like that. But... I do have to recognize that they made valuable engineering contributions in motor racing, and that's what we've done here today, and ultimately that's why CMC decided to make this model as well, I am quite sure. Be that as it may, though, I do hope that this was interesting, and I do hope that this video was enjoyable for you. Until next time, Ferrari Mount 601 saying thank you all very much, and of course, we will see you soon.